Hey kids, do you want to know the cool new game that all the kids are playing? Who are you talking? There aren't any children here. It's the Voyages of Marco Polo. Hey, Marco Polo, is this the folk game where one person goes Marco and someone else goes Polo and then you both touch each other's bums? No. This is actually a German-style game of trading on the Silk Road, starting in Venice with nothing more than a dream, a pair of camels, and a small fortune in government funding. Players will go scrambling over mountains and splashing into oceans in an effort to slap their friends as metaphorical economic bum or bums. But Quinns, didn't this game literally come out like hundreds of years ago? That's right, Matthew. It came out back in 2015, promptly burped its way up the Board Game Geek rankings to the 39th best game ever made, and has been sold out since. But, like a dusty trader finally coming home stinking of spice, this game is back, and we're here to tell you whether you should buy what it's selling. And what is it selling? Well, it's mainly selling camels, the original spitty, big, bumpy boys. Not to be confused with Matthew and my grime crew. We're big and we're bumpy, we're big, bumpy boys. Matthew Lee's on the mic represent. Quincy Smith on the other microphone also representing. <laughs> The foundation of Marco Polo is dice placement. You get five rounds, and each round between two and four players are going to get some dice, they're going to roll some dice, and then take turns putting those dice onto a space. You can go to the bazaar to get some goods. You can go here to get a contract asking you to provide some goods. You can butter up a nomadic Khan. You can get a few coins. You can spend a wincingly thick stack of coins moving your trader along a route that might cost more coins, or you can, oh my goodness, all the spaces are already full, what's happening? Even with two players, there aren't very many spaces for dice on this board, and with four, it's absolutely ridiculous. And this is, I think, my favourite thing about Voyages of Marco Polo. You see, there are lots of games where you put a thing on a space and get a reward, and sometimes that space is taken, and so you have to get a different reward. And I don't find that very interesting. It's like wanting a banana and getting an orange, whereas in this, you can put dice where other people have put dice, but you have to pay one coin for every pip on the die, which is more like wanting a banana and you can't have a banana because a man got there first and he will sell it to you for six pounds. So you go to the cash point and a man there says he'll give you 50 pounds for 10 pounds. But actually, there are lots of other spaces for you to put your dice. Generous spaces, spaces overflowing with figurative bouncing bags of bananas but you can only use them if your trader gets there first. And these blue cities just give you a reward every round. Never mind polos, those are lifesavers. And then there are the glittering crown bananas of Sumatra and Beijing. Sumatra has three different places to put your dice. And this is where the game gets its replayability from, because all these spaces are randomised every game, with lots not even used. And low. Players are faced with the same question as traders of old, which is to say, which route is the least awful? Whereas I think the very sweetest potato in Marco Polo's basket is the ability for you to choose a character. It's just like Street Fighter 2, except that all of the characters slightly resemble Zangief. They also all have exactly the same facial expression, as they believe they've gotten away with farting in a very crowded room. With the exception of Rashid Adin Sinan, who wishes everyone would just stop farting, and Burke Khan, who looks as though he might have followed through. Well, of course, you can even be Marco Polo himself, the big MCPP, the big Marco Pipes. He knows how to do business. Unfortunately, he's not one person, he's two people. It's him and his dad. And yes, that does mean you get two little meeples and you can choose two different routes around the map, which changes the way you play quite dramatically. But still, you're Marco Polo, you've got your own game, you've got your own expeditions, and your dad has come along with you. It's just embarrassing. Son, have you remembered to wax the camels? Yes, Dad. Yeah, it's just last time you forgot. and uh, Dad. They, they, we had to send them back and we, end up, we had to pay a postage on sending them back as well, return postage on all those camels. Dad, Just because was... you forgot to wax them. Yeah, when I was eight, that was 25 years ago. You're gonna answer that. Hello, Marco Polo. Marco, it's your uncle, Matteo. I'm also in the game. It's, it, it's my game. Listen, you got any silk? I'm kidding. I got all the silk. I got so much silk. 
Why can't you be more like your uncle? You don't see him needing any help from his dad. That's because his dad is useless and obsessed with Russian martial arts. I won't hear anything about no-show cargo polo Marco's judo. But whichever of these characters you choose, it ain't gonna save you. Nothing's gonna save you from your troubles. In a lot of German-style games like this, you're building a machine. Or you're trying to carve the perfect racing line through a series of rewards, like a slalom skier getting points. In this, though, frequently you've just got problems. You've got no money, which means you can't do things. You've got no contracts, which means you've got no prospects, son. Or you're in Kashgar and you're stuck and you haven't got a camel and you need a camel. And this is the fun of the game. The fun is in trying to save yourself. Another thing that won't save you are the tools that you're given before or after you place a dice that let you change the game slightly. Like you can spend a dice always to get three coins, or you can spend three coins to grab one of the rare black dice from the middle of the table. You can spend camels to re-roll your dice, or you can spend more camels to tweak your dice up or down. And then by using everything you have access to, you can solve these problems in a way that feels smart and satisfying. Like on your very first turn before anyone else, you leap into the pepper bazaar. You grab that pepper, you've got some pepper, great. And then in your next action, you use the Samarkand power that only you can because you've traveled there to turn that pepper into some camels and then you use the camels to re-roll a dice and then you fulfill the contract that gives you the move and you've got the camels. So now you can make it to Kochi and get your reward of glittering, lovely gold. And now you're playing and that's water polo, baby. As in water polo, you turned out to be Marco. You're an asset to the family. Might have turned out to be quite a polo, but you're still not as good a polo as your uncle is, are you, Marco? Hello, yeah, uh, it's, I need spices, frankincense and myrrh. There goes with the silver? Cardamom? No. So you juggle coal business like a pro, tutting and frowning and prioritising your way through the first few rounds. And you enjoy a nice arc that we think is responsible for a lot of the game's good ratings. Initially, visiting... Beijing? That seems insurmountable. Reaching that? Impossible. But with each new city that you get to, you enjoy a little more breathing room. Until gradually, gradually you start to look at the whole board with new eyes, searching for new ways to score victory points. By the way, speaking of this, do you like my camels? I got a guy in Ottawa, flat packs them. Oh no. So choosing a character at the start of the game is cool and it gives your early game a sense of direction and you don't get lost, but, 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 this game does inevitably end up being you kind of swimming and lost in a sea of generic victory point opportunities. And after you've literally crossed the mountainous terrain of your struggles, it is just a case of looking down and doing a thing and doing a thing which gets you things, which gets you more things, and then maybe you'll win. There's something about this school of design in which you sit around and you scramble for points because points that in 2017 just doesn't feel good enough. You've got a mechanically solid game with an acceptable lick of paint over the top of it, but it doesn't feel like at any point the designers or the artist have really cared too much about the theme of the game and, and thought about what makes this game different, what can make it pop to life and feel like something unlike other things on the shelves. And there's something to me embodying the fact that one of the designers and the illustrator have chosen as the photographs that they want to broadcast themselves to the world, themselves smoking a cigarette and smoking a cigar. The universal symbols for, I'm done here. And it's like, and you know what, the things you need to do to a game like this just to make it pop and bring it to life a bit more, they're not dramatic things, you know, you don't need a Fantasy Flight style game of story cards or a way of representing the strife of dying camels, it's just small things here and there. The art in this is perfectly nice, but then you look at it and you think, well hang on, why do Moscow and Alexandria, Alexandria, an Egyptian city, look Chinese? The game is perfectly solid, but then we are merchants, we care about money and only money, but Actually, money in this game, because the design, is almost literally pointless. No, you trade money and things for victory points. What are victory sort of points exactly? Anodyne things, and it's just simple things like, why would this game be better if instead of victory points, you amassed a pile of coins in front of you? Yes. yes. <laughs> it would. The games we've been recommending recently have all felt like labours of love. The artists and the designers working together to 
bring this this grand game that they envision that needs to exist in and this feels not like a labor of love but more like labor it does what is expected of a european german style game and not necessarily much more. And so when I'm looking at these details of being like, well, this could have been better, this tiny thing, it may seem like nitpicking, but really it isn't. Once you've got a game design which is solid, and a lot of game design is solid, it's all about then having this detail, these tiny contextual things to just pop the game to life. It's the icing on the cake. All right, Matthew. Yes. Here's what I want to put past you. If we'd reviewed this game in 2015, we probably would have recommended it because you agree, it's a good game. It's very good. Yeah. It looks nice, the theme is quite good, the, the puzzle is really excellent. I mean, you have to remember that moving things around and doing a thing and doing a thing and doing a thing and getting points is still good. When we played last, we had a head-to-head -head game, two-player, and I had a mad move where I was, realized I could spend every last penny I had to do this, then this, then this, then this, and got a whole bunch of points, and it was, it was cool. And how smart did you feel? I felt really clever. It was exhausting, but that stage in these games always is. And yet we don't recommend this game. No, we don't so recommend So here's this my game. question to you. Is this how Shut Up and Sit Down ends? I mean, not like literally with this review, but does it end with our standards creeping higher and higher and higher? Because every time we find a game we recommend, that's like, it. every game we recommend makes it harder to recommend all future games because it's like, well, just buy, I don't know, just buy Concordia, just buy a Great Western Trail, buy A Feast for Odin. Like, it, it's crazy. It, I'm stuck on the fact this was an award-winning game in 2015 and just two years later, we're like, it's not good enough. I think it comes down to the fact that, like, you know what? Like, it doesn't need to be that you have a perfect collection of things where you, like, have your, your perfect Eurogame. Your perfect... The theme is a lot of fun. And, like, you could be like, I've got, I like this theme, so I've got this theme. But I think what we're seeing now is it's just, it's not good enough when stuff it doesn't go the extra mile. Yeah. I think it's not a case of being like, you know, don't get this game because you already have this game. I just think it gets to a point where you go, well, like, why would you have something which is like this and an okay theme when you have something that's just like this but dripping in theme. Yep. And it, it isn't a case of making the game any less dry. Like, you don't need to change the mechanics. It's literally just putting that extra care into framing. Like, you know, Great Western Trail. Like, you, yes, you, you're going and doing things and getting points, but you're also going, look how many train stations I've made. Look, look at how, my cows. Look at my, how many cows I've got. Look at how many rosettas I've got. And it's just a way of making it feel like the points you have actually do something. Yes, I agree. So, um, so this is like almost like a sea change. Like, unless your game is just astonishing, then it's if you're just... going to do something vanilla and old school like this, I, I don't think it's a case of going, oh, there's, you know, every time we review something like this, we're just going to go, oh, don't bother. I just think if you're going to keep it restrictive like this and not try and rock the boat and not do anything interesting or innovative, it's got to be airtight. Which is Concordia. Concordia is something as interesting as this, but with a third or a quarter of the rules. So, yeah, there you go. Sorry, Mr. Polo. It's not quite Polo enough. We can't save your life. in my son. He's yeah. about it, trading. I can't go anywhere without me. Your mother would be furious if she were here. She's not. Because <laughs> she fell in that big pile of wax camels. <laughs> I think, I think it, it's best if people take care of you. Well, come on, how are we going to make our next million? Yeah, Global you... shipping of miniature camels. Okay, well, I mean, a, a, a few points come to mind with that. The first of which are you sure you wouldn't be, be happier in a home? Marco. Polo. You're supposed to say polo. <laughs> and then we touch each other's bums. Uh, I'm a grown man now, Dad. Oh. <laughs> Did you know there's art all over the world? Yeah, we remember we've seen some of it on the trips we did. Do you remember, Dad? It's good, this. Do you remember? Yeah. Your mum got me for Christmas. Mum's gone, Dad. You shouldn't talk about her anymore. I miss her, son. I miss her.
Should we buy some camels? No, I, I think, I th actually, I think that you've been buying a lot of camels and I think it's, I think you're doing it to keep busy and avoid confronting your I'm feelings. I'm gonna give your uncle a ring. <laughs> Marco. I've had it with this, I've had it, I've had it. I'm trying to work and you, let's be real, not, ooh. <laughs> Maybe you are my dad. Mate, sorry, I got you How confused. How you do that to your own father? I got confused. 